Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Manufacturing Talks. I'm Jim Vinosky. We're sponsored by Cosgrove Content, wordsmiths for industry. So if you struggle with getting people who can write about the manufacturing work you do, the technical kinds of things, Look up Cosgrove Content at CosgroveContent.com. And I am uh, thrilled to be joined today for episode 25 with my first in-person interview with Dave Yonkman of DYS Media. He's the president over there. Welcome, David. Thank you so much, Jim. I can't tell you how much of uh, a pleasure it is to come be your 25th guest in studio, in person, in the flesh. This was meant to be. This is awesome. So, yeah, Dave and I have a history together. Um, definitely mutually supporting here in West Michigan on things we do. And we're going to talk today about what Dave does with his company and what you guys can learn, whether you're in manufacturing, my core audience, or more broadly speaking, just, you know, the business community in general, because there's a wealth of knowledge sitting next to me here. So let's <laughs> tap into it. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about what you do, Dave. Well, I'm so glad you gave me that introduction, Jim. I would love to. <laughs> so yeah, we manufacture digital PR at DYS Media. We work primarily with manufacturers in energy, healthcare, primarily those sectors. And what we do is we we get you found by the right people. So, you know, we work with a lot of uh, people in the tool and die industry, a lot of people in the machine industry, original equipment manufacturers. We work with defense. And what we find with a lot of folks is that they, you know, they think, well, this is this is consumer stuff. It doesn't apply to me. I, I have a very specific set of customers. Very true. But those very success, you know, but those customers you have are also looking at you and 20 other people who are competing right. with you. So what we do, figure out what, you know, just talk with you, learn your story. What is the one thing or the two things that you're doing differently than anyone else is your mark, anyone else in your market is doing? We take those and we make it. We make that a big deal. When people come to your website, they know exactly what it is, what you provide, the forms of their specification that people can fill it out, and it streams line, streamlines prospecting. It's kind of a better sales process, more more thorough than just the feast or famine where you know you go from three months to three months, uh, working from contact to contact, wondering what's happening next. And what that is, and so what we do is we really work with you finding keywords. Load up your con, you know, load up your website to make sure they get found with those organically. It's up there. We also do paid and get it out some other time, but that's primarily what it is. You have maybe 20 customers out there, but you need to get in front of those 20 customers. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of customers you may not even know about, but we've been really successful in getting people to come to find the customers we work with, get on their website, fill out those forms, as well as job candidates. I mean, these are people actually filling out forms on the website, downloading mm -hmm. or downloading applications, submitting resumes. They're not going through Indeed, uh, not through LinkedIn. And that's really what we're all about, getting you found by the right customers, the right employees, and the people you want to surround yourself with. Yeah. So, you know, you hit on some critical things there, obviously, the building and maintaining the customer base has always been a challenge obviously today and any anyone out there who's not having the struggle on the people front on the um, recruiting side is Doing definitely well. blessed yes yeah. um but if we back up a step you know what i've said a lot of the times is manufacturers sometimes in our own way we tend to be our own worst enemy right yeah talk a little bit about you know where manufacturers come from some of the blind spots that are fundamental and then Let's dig into the details on how we get after that. Yeah, I think the most fundamental part of it is that people, regardless of um, where you live, you know, people in the machine industry, tool and die industry, power recording, they don't understand really what they have and the value that they're really able to provide people. So some of the blind spots are <laughs> they feel as though. I'm not saying this is for everybody, but I often feel as though there is a very limited market for the products and services. A lot of times, um, um, these men and women have owned these companies for 30 years and mm -hmm. ran them successfully, made payroll every month, and say, hey, well, you could be making more money more consistently with a better workforce, um, with these opportunities that are available to you. And it's a lot of stuff that's not even really need to buy. It is just need to go out and do it. But own yourself. Own your work. Be proud of it. And get your stuff made in when, and you know, that is the first thing people see when they search, when they, today, when the first thing people look for when they, when they try to find out about you is they look for you online. 
And what you want is these, um, well, that's the other big part of what we do with the media placements, mm -hmm. where we get you in a new story that talks about how much value you add to your market or to your customers. That make, that comes up in the first sentence, yeah. our first uh, couple of search results and people are looking for you. But that's your first impression on the world, your website. And you what and, and yeah, you may have limited customers, but you're all but that next customer could come in with the $20 million job because you had, I mean, you looked professional, you yeah. looked the part, you 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 made um the products and services they're looking for. Yeah. Do you see as you look out at um you know, especially the small and medium-sized manufacturers today, is it pretty prevalent where that digital presence is lacking, is dated. You know, I've heard so many people who are, um, you know, professionals at, at getting that image out there saying, yeah, manufacturing in, in particular lags the market in what's expected digitally. I would counter by saying the market, that market is exactly where they need it to be. Really? It's worked for 30 years. Um, if you're getting, you're getting the business that you have and then, all of the people who are in your say say you know your same say age group mm -hmm. your same demographic you're speaking to those people mm -hmm. with their language yeah um so that's not so bad but what what we do need to recognize going into the future is that the people were you were just we're talking about people yeah. doing tool and die forever they're um what do you call it? digital analogs yeah, they're not digital natives like the millennials who are born. So they're not the ones that are going to your websites um, and uh, searching for you online. And that's fine because that way we can back up even further to to talk about that your product is your marketing. You can't have one without the other. So if you have a poor product, no marketing is going to make it better. Uh -huh. If you have so a great product, you can have the worst marketing and not talk to people about it. That's fine. But it's really more fundamental than that because you're saying if you're not understanding your product and, and the true value it represents, um, what that brings to the table up front, it doesn't matter what you pile on in the digital realm or in traditional advertising or marketing. You're already missing the boat. Yeah, and that's where I blew it earlier. It's all about <laughs> word of mouth. It's all about word of mouth. So if you're an analog, if you're a digital analog, you want to start with word of mouth. You're going to build your super consumers around you. You're going to have people that are going to like what you do on LinkedIn. They're going to, um, um, these, these digital natives are going to like what they do on LinkedIn. They're going to be good looking for your website. They're going to be building out uh, a longer pipeline. But it really does, whether you are starting out with $20,000 in capital or you have a $50 billion business, it it's all word of mouth. You surround yourself with close people who become your, su your super consumers, hopefully mm -hmm. like-minded people who are evangelizing what you do. But I said, it doesn't matter if you're a $5 billion business. If you're a horrible person and you surround yourself with horrible people, you're going to deliver a horrible service, a horrible product, and you're going to reject um, and you're not going to, you're not going to draw in the people that are going to make you a better person mm -hmm. and grow your, your business. Yeah. And so even when you're that high, it's always about providing more value, getting yourself around the right people. So what should manufacturers think about if you're saying I'm, I'm a manufacturing business owner and I'm just thinking about this, there's no crisis or anything. I just want to kind of reevaluate and set myself up for the future. What's the starting point? What's the core thought process there? The great starting point is always going to be what is your customer's problem and how do I fix it? Yep. And how do I become such a part of the solution that your business cannot live without me? Mm -hmm. That's where you want to. Um, that's where you want to put the uh, put the manufacturers, position them in front of their customers, and so that and, and that also leads into something that you know, digital and analog native can can track into it's it's doing consistent marketing you know putting you know consistent um messages out there online and in the media to make sure that that everything is consistent people can find you when they need to find you and if they've been doing that for the past you know once it sort of picked up in the 1990s i can only imagine where their business would be right now but it's mm -hmm. not too late to start start today never too late in the yeah. digital realm and that way you're not feast or famine you can put your prospects in more measured in a more, in more of a system. Mm -hmm. So uh, the thought occurred to me as you were talking, I think one thing that manufacturers, uh, a trap that we can fall into is thinking about our product as a commodity, 
right? And, yeah. and, and in some cases it is, right? Um, but then your product might be a commodity, but the way you deliver it, your service doesn't have to be a commodity. And so you can always make yourself that uh, immensely valuable source for your customer. I always look at every customer as someone you treat with white glove service. If you decided that, you know, if you if you mutually decided that you can work together, produce something of value, you've hit you you've struck gold. Now, if we shift gears and we get away from focusing on that digital realm, you mentioned that word of mouth piece, and I think that we ought to dig into a little more because you know people think about that, and it's almost like just this constant back of the mind thing but even more today with you know stuff like linkedin and facebook and um instagram and all that word of mouth which used to be passed just person to person in real life happens lightning speed across the world people aren't really giving that it's fair due for what much greater value it has today right yeah, no, there is a lot to be said for that. But the uh, the one challenge you have with all these new um, new social media sources mm -hmm. and newsletters and things, it's all free. You go on Twitter, everyone's opinion is free. Mm -hmm. And that's about how much it's worth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on LinkedIn, <laughs> on Facebook. And the, when people don't go there to find value. Sometimes, you know, you follow some great people on LinkedIn. Um you read some great material. I follow you on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Your Forbes columns—they're they're a great thing to read, and I get value out of it. But ninety-nine, ten—you know, ninety-nine times, ninety-nine times out of one, are you going to get something that's really going to move you, motivate you to give your money to somebody else? But you mentioned like you and I follow each other, and then we've got our own networks that start to intermingle and mesh. Yeah, intertwine. And so, yeah, there's a lot of chaff out there. Absolutely, a lot, lot of just you know, wastrels in the digital space. But to me, that value of those people that you do respect and that and that you do want to do business with and you're doing business with now, they become that jumping off point to share with their network. Absolutely. And so that's, and so that's where I look at, you know, you talk about word of mouth, how much greater it's gotten in my mind is in those digital connections that you kind of, you, you don't have to go out and buy. You can just make them by engaging the right way yeah it certainly made it a lot easier i mean it's just it's definitely shrank the world but it's still going to come down to that face-to-face -face meeting you know yeah. when you're talking well, when you're talking point. about millions hundreds of millions of dollars in deals you know you're not going to respond to a facebook ad and, no uh, it can be the you know, foot in the and, door yeah yeah it's a great way to make an introduction but yeah once you, you got to really know people and that's what you find you find like-minded people who are out to actually produce and not get something for nothing mm-hmm and that's a great place to start. Okay, so regardless how we started, whether it's in the real world realm or the digital realm, let's let's go to that next step. What is it that's going to set someone aside when you have that face-to-face -face meeting? What what should we be thinking about that people might be missing um, to to present their product in the way it should be presented and, and to, I guess convey what the value is what the value proposition is for the customer yeah i think that's a big you know it's a huge issue that uh, and it's a it's a very fundamental issue too especially mm -hmm. with um you know younger folks are just getting into sales they don't really understand the sales process is not a matter of you know badgering you to buy something one after another is to make a connection well, no, the the um pitches on linkedin five seconds after you've connected with me those are always effective to me <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, we you know hey we do, you know we run a PR business. Hey, we we offer great PR services. <laughs> can we get on I the phone? This yeah, afternoon? <laughs> I was like, yeah let's, let's get on the phone. I'm sure you can sell me something I don't need. <laughs> yeah, it, but it, it really is. You know, people do business with people. Yeah, they don't yep. do business with machines. So that being said, though, you get the people um, who you connect with. You still have to convey to that person why you're the superior product. And, and when I say product, it can be the actual product or it can be the way you deliver the product, the way you deliver the service. So how, how do people get after that? It, you know, you've talked to me incessantly about knowing your value and yet people miss that all the time. How, how do you break through that mindset of, no, I'm just another, you know, 
cogging the wheel out here. You're a great example of it, Jim. You just, you know, <laughs> you get out of bed and you commit yourself to doing the next right thing. You, you treat everyone you meet with respect um, until, and give everyone the benefit of the doubt until they don't deserve it. Um, I, you know, it can't be, it can't be any more stark than that. And then people see that it comes through you when you're committed to doing an inc incredible work, when you're committed to treating your customers with white gloves, giving them your all, that is marketing. That's branding. That's people seeing you, who you are. Like Walt Disney, a great example. Mm -hmm. He'd walk around the parks and when he was walking around, he'd pick up trash everywhere he went. Yeah. Why? He set the example. Are any employees going to feel responsible to do these little details if the big guy's not mm -hmm. going to? Right. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we've talked a good bit about, you know, pricing. And, you know, clearly we're in a competitive marketplace. Um, there's also that race to the bottom, right? How, how do you avoid getting caught up in that uh, commodit commoditization of your product, your business, uh, and driving, getting the right price for what you offer? The way to do that is to stop competing. Stop competing. Ah, Stop. How about that, people? How about never heard that one before? Have you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, not 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 all competition. Stop yep. competing on price. Yes. Stop competing on taking away value from your products to get to a lower price. <laughs> the fact is, people's value is all on perception. I mean, how much did how much did a box of rice uh, rice krispies cost you before General Mills popped on Snap Crackle and Pop? Uh, and yeah, we got to get this right. That's Kellogg's. Kellogg's. I'm so <laughs> Remember, sorry. I, I so come sorry. from the cereal world. <laughs> Legend has it. I talked to you about Cinnamon Toast Crunch. I yes, Rice that Krispies is with Kellogg's. Cinnamon Toast Crunch is, is anyway. a product I used to proudly make for General Mills. But yes, so how much keep on with the story how much of the competitors <laughs> there at Kellogg's. <laughs> well, look what they did. Um, you know, when the recession hit, they had already primed themselves to, you know, who knew that breakfast was boring? I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, well, of course, I you know I was born in the, yeah, in the 70s. long before your time. Yeah, but, yeah. but so, I get it. Yeah. But back then, who knew breakfast was boring? And all of a sudden, Kellogg's came around and said, "Hey, look at these three little guys. They can jump around and make funny noises, snap, crackle, pop." You got yourself an experience. Mm -hmm. And who did you compete with? Nobody. You competed with yourself. Yeah. Said, "All right, how do we? What what is a non obvious problem here? What are, what is a problem that nobody even sees, and that they need a solution?" And it's not. It's almost a non-obvious solution. Yeah, it's like we don't know that breakfast is boring and that yeah. it's really starting off our day to stink, and we could be having a, a lot of fun with the kids around the breakfast table looking for the secret prize. Well, and you just touched on something too. It was about knowing who the customer was because before that Very they true. were selling to the parents. Now you're selling to the kids, and realizing that yeah, kids influence those purchasing decisions was huge. Yeah. No, I. It, it's absolutely phenomenal what you can do with your products. And, that's, and to that point, they didn't change Rice Krispies. No. It was the same puffed rice that went back to Will Keith back in the sanitarium, right? <laughs> I didn't hear that part. Oh, yeah, that's where they got started. No. Will Keith Kellogg had a sanitarium in Battle Creek and invented breakfast cereal because that was part of his health regimen. Yeah. And then his brother, I think, grew the company from there. <laughs> yeah. That's an amazing So it was the same... Puffed rice that they came up with as the healthy breakfast for these people who wanted to improve their lives. And then, yeah, they're marketing <laughs> to kids a couple generations later and, you know, and making we, them in. Yeah, here we are 100 years later. Yep. And you still, when you walk into all these, you will still pay 2 to $3 more for a same size box of Cinnamon Toast Crunch than you will for the Cinnamon Crunch Squares, the Aldi brand yep. or whoever they get yeah. it from. Mm -hmm. It works. And how you had a great example not too long ago with Stormy Cromer talking about their, you know, anyone would say, oh, that, there's Elmer Fudd's cap. Nobody wears those things. True. Only people in the, the upper peninsula of Michigan, uh, some parts of Wisconsin, if I'm not mistaken, wear these That's hats. Right. And they're considered kind of goofy. But then look what happened. So, you know, the, the person originally had the company, sold it to all these people. I mean, sold, you know, sold these hats to all these people. But then the market was limited. It was done. The person, then the person who bought the company, said, you know, wait a second. We can do a lot more with these. So they started getting into more marketing. They started getting into different markets. They started making, um, not ever changing the cap itself, 
they change experiment with different colors, different ways of get, putting in front of people. And now what, what they've grown how much? Like seventeen percent um the past two years, like ninety percent. Yeah, and something put it this way, when when my and, and so folks, this is a hometown story. If you haven't been watching the show, I did have Bob Jackwert uh, on early, very uh, very early in in my program. He was uh, at the time the CEO of uh, Jack Ware Fabric Products, which owns Stormy Comer. Now his daughter, Gina, Gina has taken over. And those two together took the business from where what they made in a year, they now make in a week. Wow. So, yeah, uh, the numbers are incredible. And it was all about what Dave's talking about, where they had this, you know, it was something of a commodity product and not a, a wide market at all. Um, didn't change the fundamental product, but added to it positioned it differently, um, marketed it smarter, and built this whole quirky, trendy thing around the hat and then apparel and um, just all kinds of products that were analogs to the hat using the same, you know, the basic red plaid, uh, the, the number one color for the hat and expanding from there. It's a, an amazing story. So go look that up if you're looking at a way to take an old stodgy business and grow it into something Unbelievable, Stormy Cromer, great example. And that leads right into another way that you add value to your customers, add features to your service. Mm -hmm. Talk about the non-tangible stuff that comes with the peace of mind of what you provide your customers. Yeah. You're not going to get that peace of mind with, um, say, a competitor of yours who's always going to have their own problems and tell you why they're late be the person's on time that does stuff on budget. Yep. <laughs> but then look what, you, what else you could do is add value to what you already do. And the iPhone's the best example that I can think of at the top of my head. You know, when we grew up, we had a landline phone. It's, it's yeah. embarrassing. You know, we had landlines. <laughs> and it was until 2003 that I finally got rid of a landline <laughs> and, and we had mobile phones. Uh -huh. And it was in our dreams <laughs> looking at the Jetsons and these cartoons about, whoa, we can, you know, in the future, we'll be able to talk to each other and see each other by phone. That'll never happen. What's next? Flying cars. <laughs> but what Apple did is they uh, electric flying cars. <laughs> what they did, what Apple did is they came in and said, okay, this is a phone. You know, this is a, a cordless, wireless, cellular telephone. What more could we do with it? So today, if you can't open your garage door, if you can't turn on your irrigate your water, your lawn irrigation system with your phone, if you can't um, get the um, the live stream from the moon on your camera, oh, it's it, it's not a good product. Yeah. <laughs> Apple has made this the standard, and what happened? Yeah, stuff we only would have ever <laughs> dreamed of. 30 years ago. And they're all putting it into a phone. Yeah. And it's just taking these non-obvious solutions and making them obvious. Yeah. And I won't get live without one. Talk about being indispensable. Let's go back. You know, you made a point early on about um, treating people right, treating your customers right, doing the right thing. I hear that so much, and I get to cover some amazing companies. And the ones that I most respect and wind up just falling in love with if I wasn't already in love with them are the ones who they're not just out there treating their customers right and you know putting on this this face of being a moral company to sell stuff oh, they're yeah. the ones who you know when their employees suffer a tragedy they're right there in the trenches with them yeah. taking care of them um how do you think that works you know we talk about karma and, and these supernatural forces in the world, but you see it all the time. When it's true, companies treat their people right, they succeed. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And that's the big thing, you know, when you go to talent acquisition, you always have to remember this is where we spend one third of our lives mm -hmm. is at work. Yeah, or more. Or, oh gosh, a lot more for some of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But we do, and we want to be proud of where we work. We want to be proud of what we've accomplished and what we've done. And that, you know, that, that's true for everyone across the board. And when you're proud of that, you're going to attract, you're going to not only attract those candidates that you want that live up to those ideals, you're going to attract the people those candidates surround themselves with. You're going to not you do nothing but build a good company if you're treating it with respect. Because yeah, people see when people see the the happy um, barbecue Fridays or, you know, um, the birthday celebration for the employees. Yeah, it's all happy stuff. It's great. It's nice and everything. But, hey, let's do this every day. 
what I find interesting is, you know, there are those companies that will have those happy events and publicize yeah. them and, and use that as marketing. The ones I see succeeding don't make a big play yeah. with we treat our people right. They're just out there doing it. Doing it. And, you know, there's obviously going to be an element of that where now the people who are on the front lines making the product, selling the product, marketing the product, they're true believers and they're in love with both the product and the company because of the way they're treated. And yet there's, to me, there's more to it that comes through that makes a company successful just because of that, that fundamental value, that moral nature of the people at the top who treat people well. Yeah. And it's true. And that's the, that's the most fundamental thing of all. You watch what people do, not what they say. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you see these people that talk about, um, because you will see a completely different story on LinkedIn than when you go <laughs> to talk to your neighbor yep. about that same that's position. True. Yes. Guarantee. Well, not guaranteed. There's some, no, there's a, you and I have found that they're all plenty of awesome manufacturing companies right. out there we can work with but, but there are some that and the ones are not you, so much the ones you don't write about <laughs> the ones i will not take on as customers yep. yeah they're out of the picture yeah and so knowing the value of your product treating your people right um treating your customers right what what else is in the secret sauce of this whole thing of of uh you know having your company deliver the the value it should be delivering the biggest thing the biggest thing that people can do is change their mindset from being the hero to being the guide in the hero oh journey. oh yeah so, so now you gotta at, you gotta go into the background of that let's That's let's go into the framework discussion. real quick yeah. you know that the hero story is you start with a hero <laughs> run you know so the basics he runs into a problem doesn't know what to do meets a guide gives the hero a plan and a call to action to get that done the hero goes through those steps and Number one, achieve success, and most in in also equally important, avoids failure. Too many, um, you know, too much. And I kind of alluded to this earlier, but one of the the big problems that people have in, in talking about their products and getting people to learn about them is they start talking about themselves mm -hmm. as the hero. Yeah. Hey, I've got this Fanic. I've you know I've got this new five set of Fanic Hitachi robot arms in my in my uh, um, my shop that can cut this piece and that piece. But how about you go in? You don't, you, you're, you're not the hero with the stuff. You're, you're the guy who's trying to help your customer get to where they need to be. Ask your customer what their problems are. Talk yeah. to them. Find out what, find out what they need. And you're not going to get there by coming in as a, your own hero and expecting them to almost be the guide. You got to be the guy. You got to look at your customer as someone who's, they got a challenge. They, you know, they got to, they got to sell more products. They, you know, they got to bring in more revenue. They got to, um, you know, meet recruitment goals but so your your challenge is to go in and show that your customer how to be the hero how to meet those sales goals how to increase revenue uh, how to meet recruitment goals and bring them to the success in avoiding failure i'd say that's the biggest part just listening to what listening instead of talking mm -hmm. To identify what um, the person you're working, what they truly need, whether they're a customer, or your friend, or the family, ask questions. Yeah. What about helping your customer with that concept himself too? You know, I, I see so many companies that don't listen. So many people in companies who, you know, want to know or, or want to believe they have all the answers, want to be that hero instead of going out. You know, for example, just a manufacturer in one location, a plant um forcing down supposed solutions on the people on the floor rather than going and talking to the people on the floor yeah. and saying what is it that's causing you these problems let's fix that um yeah to me that's another down. element of that service you can provide is you know not strong arming someone and saying you're an idiot don't do that but yeah you know influencing to say yeah i'm gonna make you the hero now you've got to go make your people the hero make yeah. your customers the hero yeah I mean, it all translates. Yep. Make sure you're doing it to your for your employees. Your employees are the heroes. Yes, you're the guy. That's right. Yeah, you know, you're supposed to know more. You're supposed to know better. So, so for all you Tolkien fans out there, you are not Frodo. <laughs> your customer and your and their people and your people are Frodo. You are Gandalf. And for someone who's never seen Lone Survivor, I'd, I'd have no reference to those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or it must be some kind of TV show you've been seeing. 
Oh, anyway, boy. we go to Yoda. You know, these are all guides. Yes. And watching Supernatural. So you're not the brothers either, right? <laughs> your customer, they're the brothers. I'll just have to uh, take your advice on that one. <laughs> okay. Well, let's swing over and talk about your business. So, um, you know, you mentioned what you do. What are you looking at for the future? How are you being that guide for your customers? Yeah, it's interesting. So I come from a Capitol Hill background. It's, you know, I'm totally in politics. Everything's about messaging. All, all the bills are writing. You know, we introduce a bill. It's not a it's not a bill to really do anything. It's a bill to message, you know, to mm -hmm. get out there and say, we introduce this bill that says um, save all the kittens from drowning act. You know, it's not like there's a bill that's going to be passed or that will go to the Senate. Mm -hmm. It's all messaging. <laughs> and then what I found when I came into the real world, the manufacturing, not just working on the policy end of it. Is that we've had to make the transition of moving real products moving real services, making people, you know, getting people, not getting people to buy stuff, but solving people's problems. Right. In the real world. Yes. Yep. And so, so what we've done is, so, you know, you just want to think about public relations. It's you send a press release to the local paper about a picnic you're having or some kind of event or an award ceremony the chamber is going to have, um, you know, it's going to have uh, something that comes up and you get that in the paper. But PR is totally, it, what we do is unlike any of that. So the process, the process we work with, you know, it all starts with the keywords. We always want to know exactly how do you talk about yourself? How do people talk? How do other people talk about you? How do people talk about you when you're not listening? That's mm. what you really want to know. Yeah. And then that way we can start, you know, the, what, the first route is often to go through your website, tune it up organically um, with these keywords that attract people who are looking for your products and services. It's organic. It's natural. You don't have to pay for Google ads when you go down this route. And the second part of that. And stop me from if I'm getting too confusing, but the you know the, the the second leg of that is the public relations, the media placements component. So we'll work with folks, you know, with um, columnists like you, nationally revered, and they know, and I know that when you write, when Forbes, when they're put under the Forbes banner, that elevates their their perceived perception value just to such a high degree. And that's also the first thing people find because mm -hmm. Forbes is such a great publication. So, um, so, but Forbes is not, you know, in total respect, Jim, you're not going to be interested in every story I have to give you. Right. In fact, you're going to reject nine out of 10, but what we're going to do, and we've been able to strike gold a couple of times and find, you know, found customers like Eridatum, um, the energy company, Rank America, where these, these, um, but they do they do coincide with each other, you know. In your manufacturing, talking about defense, mm -hmm. um, the manufacturing energy, energy of the future. It's but there are also but but Forbes might not be the best place for that in some cases. So say Rank America, they're the, you know they're rolling out a new transmission, new tank. They got to get this product in front of army procurement officers. So they're not you know maybe that they do read Forbes, but they're also going to be reading other targeted publications like defense news mm -hmm. and these are the wall street journals of the defense world yeah yeah for that corner of the manufacturing business yeah and all the defense papers and get yeah. that and so the, the channel so you want to sell these products you, you have a very specific audience you have about what um I don't know, a couple hundred thousand procurement officers who might buy your product in the u.s army that's where we come in we want to get those procurement officers to see your name come up as the first result when they say we want the best product in this class or these specs we want them to find you mm -hmm. and that way you're not, you know, you don't necessarily have to go out and do all the initial RFPing or you can already have that leg up. People know about you. They've seen your website. They've seen you up here in prestigious magazines like Forbes. And it's kind of like, why aren't we talking to them? And as you said before, maybe it's a little tighter in the military, but when we're talking about commercial procurement lines. You're talking, um, you know, how many different procurement officers could there be? in for a machine shop and they can go outside the lines and go for the superior product and go yeah, all the way got back that story to tell right yeah yeah and they know that you're a hard-working honest person they, they then this is what this is how they learn about you it's jim vanoski at forbes writing about how awesome you are <laughs> it's not you telling people how awesome you are yeah i mean try taking out an ad in the front page of the paper that says i am the greatest person in the world <laughs> who's gonna believe it yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> But you work with someone who tells honest storytelling for a living, and you get and, and you, an authentic person, are telling their authentic story. That's that's winning. Yeah, that's yeah. that's moving your product. That's getting great, um, getting great people around you. Cool.
All right, what haven't we touched on that we ought to talk about? What haven't we touched on? Oh, gosh, we got to, Jim, we haven't touched manufacturing 4.0. Ah, oh, yeah. That's an interesting one. That's one that I've been engaged with for some time. And, and you know, it's, for me, it's this two-pronged thing where there's just tremendous value on the one side. I mean, clearly, uh, automation across the board is, is going to be an even greater player in our manufacturing future. At the same time, though, to me, there's so much hype. There's so much push by the companies just trying to sell their tinker toys. Um, yeah. how, how do people, especially small and medium manufacturers, uh, cut through all that noise and, and really get to, to solutions that are true values for them? People that are trying to sell see solutions ought to be selling you solutions to your problems. Yeah. You shouldn't yeah. be buying not, from... <laughs> not saying here's, here's the lighthouse um, plant in Sweden that you have to make your plant exactly like or you're failing that's yeah crazy yeah absolutely and so the so um you know everyone talks about 4.0 the challenges and opportunities and that you know that it all brings i look at industry 4.0 as i'm saying okay these guys are coming out with all this great stuff uh maybe and they're coming out with great solutions who knew uh you know i think we're going to be seeing um hitachis and the uh, anafenic robot arms making our uh making our fast food at mcdonald's in probably yeah, a couple of months. That'll be interesting. Now we have a huge problem, though. What do we do with the robot arms when they beat up? Yep. What, how do you dispose of them? How do you dispose well, of an EV battery? How do you close and, up a lithium mine? And before that, there's also the problem of who's going to install the robot arms, who's going to service the robot arms. You know, there's so much negativity around automation saying, oh, it's doing away with these jobs. And no one ever talks about it's creating these higher level jobs. Yeah. Uh, and I, that's what I challenge people when I go see manufacturers is don't be looking at your people today who are delivering your business and delivering you wealth as disposable that when you automate things, they're going away. Yeah. And most people don't. You know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that people across the board <laughs> are, are looking at humans as you know, the same thing as capital assets. But at the same time, you know, you hear so much about force reduction and so little about upskilling and retraining and bringing those people who were doing the the more mundane and sometimes dangerous and dirty work and bringing them up to be the ones who are installing and servicing the new uh, technology. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, believe it or not, I would say there's way too much kindness. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there's not too much kindness, but you have, but... Look at, you know, you go, you go back to the family businesses that have been owned for 30 years, um, the mom and pop shops, and they've given these people jobs for this entire time. And God bless them, they don't want to let them go. I mean, they, you know, if you've been with the company for 10, 15 years, you can't just say, oh, well, we, we, we got a new robot, you're gone. But the thing, the, the thing that is holding everyone back, though, and how it's, it's a huge disservice to employees because you... Yeah, they're always going to, you're going to have people come in at a certain skill level, an entry-level job. Yeah, they're not going to go anywhere. So don't leave your people behind. Give them opportunities to upskill. And, and uh, you know, let's be fair. Not everyone is going to be able to be a computer technician. But, um, you know, at the same time, don't sell your people short. That's what I uh, always convey as a message. Is, Give them the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Let them fail. If they If they can't do it, then, you know, maybe there's something for them and maybe not. But to bring in different people from the get-go and not give your people that opportunity to me is just a, a huge disservice. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. But there opportunities abound, and that's the thing. We can't be stuck in this in well, a past mindset. we got to understand that today is today. It's not an extension of yesterday. No, and, and you're absolutely right. And it's not going to change um, the the opportunities for labor today for the, the frontline worker are greater than anything I've seen in my entire career. Yeah. So if you're not taking care of your people, guess what? Someone else will. Yeah. Someone's going to value them. Yeah. Unless they are a horrible employee. Well, they need to be let go. And yes, then that people will follow them. People have their failings. That's true. Not everyone is going to be that hero, but we can try to set everyone okay. up with that opportunity to, to be the opportunity. Up. Yes. For success. Yeah. yeah. What else? Boy, Jim, we could talk about manufacturing forever. <laughs> yes. um, We'd probably bore our people to death. Well, maybe not so much the manufacturers. I but, hope there's been some valuable. Yeah. So one last thing. Okay, we've focused on manufacturing, but you know, to me, manufacturing is kind of this crucible because 
you're either doing it or you're not, you know, there's no hiding in manufacturing, you're either making a product that holds enough value for someone to buy or you're failing. Um, how do, how do these lessons then translate to the broader business world? You know, if you're not manufacturing, can you learn from all this stuff? Absolutely. That's what I love about manufacturing. That's why we're so heavy into it. It's, it's um, the business in its purest form. You have got to sell a product that physically solves a problem, you know, a, a solution that physically solves a problem. If you're not doing that, buy, yep. you know, yep. or let's recalibrate and figure out whether, why we're not fulfilling your goal. Yeah. Why we're not fulfilling your, um, finding a solution to your problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, another piece of the manufacturing business is you'll fail sometimes. Oh, yeah. you'll have the greatest product in the world. But guess what? A new technology came along and supplanted your solution. And then what do you do? And yeah. You, know, you don't, you, I'm, I'm asking you. Then yeah. you better be agile and be ready to move on to that next thing or you. That also caution. Lose your business. Don't compete. Hey, they've got a killer product. You're never going to beat on better or lower price. Well, that's true too. You know, it is about positioning and about service. You can have the best technological solution, but if you don't have service to back it up, it's you know, no good. Always add value. Don't subtract value, especially, yep. you know, it's tricky times with a recession possibly happening, possibly already happened. Yeah. They were going through recalibrate. So what are the new problems this creates and what are yeah. the new solutions we can provide? Yeah. The new opportunities that come from it. Yeah. Cool. Jim, David, thank you. I can't thank you enough. Jim. The first in-person <laughs> interview in manufacturing talk history. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure having you on. Tune in next time, folks. It's been great having you. Again, sponsored by Cosgrove Content. Check that out. And check out Dave's business, DYS Media. Where do they find you? DYSmediarelations.com. 616-610-0533. Again, that is DYSmediarelations.com. Call me anytime at 616-610-0533. That's my mobile. He comes highly recommended from <laughs> me and my and my business and my webcast so thank you thanks so much, folks Jim. take care thanks for tuning in to manufacturing talks with jim vanosky watch for new episodes dropping on the first and third tuesdays of every month